The panel discussion is on climate governance, and we are joined by Mr. Bernard Ning, uh, forgive my pronunciation, sorry, Director of Cabinet of the uh, Minister for Climate, Environment, Sustainable Development and the Green Deal in the Belgian government, uh, Mr. William Schultz at the end, uh, who's Climate Protection Manager at the Arweiler region in Germany, and Mr. Jos Thieun, who is a board member for Portfolio Flood Protection Water Defences at Watershap in Limburg here in the Netherlands, and Swinya is staying with us. So what I'm going to ask the panel to do is to just give us a brief introduction to their take in the context of the conversation on flood resilience, and perhaps just put it, set it in context uh, for the audience, and then we'll take some questions and uh, we'll open the floor to discussion. And um, perhaps, Bernard, would you like to kick us off? I think if you, it should be on, if you just start talking, it will warm up in a second. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone here and online. Uh, yeah, the name is Mazen. I apologize, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm the chief of staff of the Federal Minister for Climate and Environment. Um, and the, the title of this panel is Climate Governance. Now, I would say climate governance in the business as usual scenario should have been in place already for two decades at least. It means having governance in a systematic, systematic and coherent way uh, in terms of mitigation, adaptation. Uh, but no, uh, I think that when we came uh, uh, in the government two years ago, uh, we did see that uh, there was not really a monitoring uh, and accountability uh, of policies and measures and of measures in terms of adaptation. Um, but uh, based on what happened last year uh, in our countries, in Germany, in the Netherlands and in Belgium, um, we do think that we need to go one step forward, further. And one year ago, just after the flood events here in, uh, in our countries, um, we suggested uh, and tabled to the government the creation of a new unit. And uh, just to explain how far it goes, we have in Belgium what is called OCAT terrorism. I repeat, OCAT terrorism. This is an organ, a unit that is reporting to the National Security Council on terrorism. Well, we tabled to the government to create an OCAT climate. Because we're talking about climate emergency, urgency, and we want to create a unit that is doing risk analysis and risk evaluation, on the basis of the three determinants that were um, projected as well in the keynote, meaning hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. Uh, we are in the full operation uh, of putting it into place uh, right now. By the way, if you would like to work for, for it, there's a job offer online at the moment. <laughs> so we're looking for people. Um, but the point is there not to do what is done already in terms of research and action and so on, but identifying where we can make improvements, um, connecting the dots, you could say. And from there, from this risk analysis and risk evaluation, then go through building of resilience, one of the themes that was discussed earlier this morning. So that very briefly, I can expand on that later. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, next, we should we go to Jos? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, for having me here uh, this morning. Um, I'm uh, a member of the, the board of directors of the Limburg Water, Water Authority. And that's, uh, well, of course, because we are in the Netherlands here, and the Netherlands is very much connected to water. We are not, uh, not well, we are called, of course, the lowlands, or easy bashing, bashing. Italian, uh, and that means that water, of course, always is very important in, uh, in, uh, in this country. 
uh, but also in our governance structure. That's why we have this separate water authority, which has three main tasks. One of the tasks, one of the main tasks is, is climate is uh, climate uh, adaptivity, and another task is uh, protection against high, high waters, especially in the in the rivers. And I am responsible for uh, the high water protection in the River Mass, which was also very much affected during the last uh, flood of, the, of, of last year. And generally speaking, in the Netherlands, we have many things, well, quite good uh, uh, in, in order, but uh, that really is uh, related to the main waters, so the main rivers, and the main coastal defenses, that these things are quite, quite good organized in the Netherlands. We were very much surprised last year by the, by the heavy floods uh, in the secondary water system, especially in the River Hill, villages like Valkenburg and Meersen, which were heavily uh, attacked. Of course, it was nothing compared to what happened in Germany and in Belgium. I have to say that because we only had material damage and no personal arms of people. But we were more or less surprised about that, that the impact could be that big. Um, so, um, more or less say uh, that we are quite well organized and we have to do a lot of things in these secondary uh, uh, water systems. And uh, uh, that's what, we, what, we, uh, what we're doing at the moment. Um, the national government uh, uh, put in place a, a special uh, uh, committee to organize this. Uh, funds have been made available to, to do it, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, a um, uh, uh, long and time-taking process, I think, uh, because we have to, to, to re-event quite some things because we are a very uh, highly dense populated country. Many people on only very little space and we have to combine many tasks in a, in a square, in a square, square meter, so to say. Uh, and that makes it quite, quite difficult, but we're used to it. Um, and Basically, when you look at the water system, uh, uh, our uh, main um, uh, theory is not to try to stop the water by building more dikes, for example, but to give room for the for the for the for the river and to to, to go with the flow, so to say. And if you look at the national um, uh, 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 the new, the new government program, the national program of the new government, where we basically say that, uh, that water and uh, the uh, uh, environment, like the, the, I'm not sure how to put it in English, but how, how the landscape looks, water and, and, and how the landscape looks, that should be the leading principles in, in, in uh, 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 building cities. Uh, look where you where you have to to, to, to undertake your activities. Um, I think that's that's for start. Okay, thank you, Lord. Yeah, thanks so much for having me as well. That's my first time hearing you, and I'm I'm absolutely thrilled. Um, okay, so I think you've introduced me as a sustainability manager. Uh, that is my my job role, uh, my position. Um, it's a quite common position for um, counties or communities in Germany, and um, the it's different facets in terms of what a sustainability manager does. Um, of course, a lot of informing the public, sort of in charge of managing and controlling the greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the county. Um, but also in some cases, and in my case is one of those special cases, climate change adaptation is part of the package. And this position existed before the flood in, in the Arbeda County as well. Um, but um, right after the flood, it was uh, put in pause. So there was no climate change, there was no time. No, no possibility to really take care of that for about six months. Um, because the, the flood, which we did not expect and which we were not prepared for, really destroyed uh, essentially the entire infrastructure in those areas that were hit. I believe we've heard enough about it already now, yesterday. Um, however, since um, April, I'm back in this job uh, of the sustainability management which now obviously has changed just like everything else has changed in our county. County. Um, the focus is now a lot stronger on climate change mitigation efforts um, because that is really where sort of the motivation is and where the pressing needs are at the time. Um, there's sort of the, the very big part of it, which is the water management. 
hydrology part of the, the R River and the basin, um, which is much bigger than sort of my position could fulfill. So that's um, mostly taken care of in other formats. Um, but there's uh, a lot of other areas which we can think of, right? So uh, schools, um, facilities, and um, sort of general land management. Um, that is what I'm focusing on at the moment. I'm very uh, excited for this panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Swenya, would you like to add uh, some, some further comments on climate governance? Well, I mean, I, I, I think, think it, it is really important, important to, to, to understand, you know, who, who owns and you know, who owns the risk and who can actually make decisions. And I think for far too long, we have like, you know, have, have lived with assumptions. And, and, you know, I think this has become quite clear um, at a community level and, you know, regional, national level, global level. Is, um, I think we, we need also more, more clarity um, about what it will take to make some, some hard decisions and choices. And I think, you know, we, in a way, what we've been discussing so far, and, you know, I think that there has been a lot of progress in bringing together different actors and you know we also see more more regulation and legislation and you know also more funding but i think you know in a way we need to recognize that it it also requires um you know, will, will require dealing with, with some trade-offs because you know and everybody makes decisions makes a lot of decisions um, about many different things and you know, we, we kind of are constantly having to take sign how, how flooding is not sort of an isolated um issue, but it needs to be integrated. And then for some of these communities that were so so horribly affected, you know, that um obviously this flooding has changed everything. But but in other communities, it's often um you know something that you experience and then yeah, well you 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 could try and quickly move on from it. And I think we often also forget it quite quickly. And I think we, we can't afford that. Um, so I think governance is, is very important. Okay, thank you. Um, could I just bring in that community element? Maybe yours. Would you, could you develop on that? I mean, what, what can be done, what more can be done to involve engaged communities and levels of awareness? Now, um, what we see is that when, when, when uh, well, we have this, this more or less legal obligation to give every citizen of the Netherlands a certain level of safety. That's, 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 based, that's based on our law. And, uh, and through that, uh, also the funds are made available on the national level uh, to, to secure it. It's a long program. It's a program that, that well, as a, as a Outlook until 2050 at, at this moment, and the funds are made available already. They are not at its normal budget, so they are pretty safe, so to say. Um, and we have this obligation to to, to, to take care that uh, uh, this safety is guaranteed. Um, so we, we, we select certain projects and then we go into a city or a village and say, okay, well, this is uh, this is what we what we uh, what what our what our task is. I mean, Go to, talk to the people, the businesses, the, the, also the, the, the people who live there, of course, and the, the, the environmental organizations. How can we reach it in the best way? Because when you're coming in, uh, some people want, uh, they, they say, well, okay, safety is, is first for us, but other people who live near the river or are, who are working with the river, they have other expectations. They want to have a nice view uh, because they, are, they want to have a nice place to live. It can be a very small village, which is very touristic, and you cannot build a wall against against the flood. So you have to start with a, with a clean sheet and say, okay, this is the obligation. How are we going to to uh, to to get to get to, to the target we are trying to reach? And you have to put in all the uh, elements which are uh, which which have uh, all the stakeholders maybe to, uh, to 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 have a saying, and then then you take care that there is a, there is a, uh, 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 people can support it and. And if you invest, but we invest much time in, at, at, at the front end, and, and it takes sometimes two, three, four, maybe five years to get to the exact plan that you want to have. But you notice that it will, um, uh, people will support it, and then 
uh, uh, you are able to do it faster than if you just go in with a plan, okay, this will be done, and we get all the legal suits and all the things. And, and so, so that it really, it really works quite well. We actually have good experience in that thing. So, and, and so, would you say that climate governance is now business as usual, as it were? Um, well, uh, especially for the for the I think for the for the uh, primary uh, water system in the Netherlands, we have we have much experience in that. But now the because the flooding in the, in the southern part of, the, of, of our province, uh, we have to introduce that as well. So that's a challenge. Okay. And Bernard, that's in a sense what, what you were saying, that, that elevating cl climate issues or flood issues to a primary policy level, that is happening. You feel that's happening. There's more to be done. Obviously, there's more well, to be done, but... <laughs> for sure. I, I, I agree with uh, what Josie is saying. Uh, but the reason for that is also that uh, we have a long-standing uh, tradition in uh, uh, water management and so on in our, in our country. So I think that has been based as well for, uh, for policy making and, and uh, for governance. Um, but um, we, are, we will be faced, we are faced with unprecedentedly new events so that will for sure uh, require a, a extra effort and, and analysis and so on. We have very clearly in uh, in also the, the keynote speech, uh, although I retain from that, for example, is that also the business sector should uh, uh, have a reflection, um, expect the unexpected yeah. uh, when it comes to, to floods and so on and so forth. And, and there we, we need as well policy making and awareness raising and interaction, stakeholder dialogue, etc., to to, uh, to get them also to, to action. And is there a scale of the unexpected? Is it, or is it there's, a, there's there's unexpected, but it's a bit more than what we've seen already. Or is, it, or is there something that could be coming that we're just not even thinking about or thinking about seriously? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's um, thank you for the question, but it's it's uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, not an easy answer in the sense that um, um, I would also like to stress that the climate issue is one of the issues. I mean, it's one of the planetary boundaries. We have also other planetary boundaries that are affecting already right now biodiversity loss, for example, uh, water scarcity affecting right now business sector. Um, I saw as well on the screen uh, during the keynote presentation, it's about the supply chains. If something is uh, happening upstream in the supply chain, it will affect industry here uh, in, in our countries as well. So it is a uh, wicked problem. I would say with quite a lot of complexity. Yeah, and get the complexity isn't going to go away. And um, are there any questions from the audience? And um, while well, people are thinking of that, can I ask? Well, there's a bit of a focus. There was a there was a pre-summit uh, two days of events on youth, focusing on youth. There'll be a little, we're hearing about that a bit more this afternoon. Is there something specific that we in you know, in, in the institute or institutes and elsewhere, what's the focus? What's the role for youth in awareness, in action, and you know, engaging with policymakers? And this is definitely for our for much of our audience here today. What we recently did is uh, 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 it's a program called Consulting Kids. And, okay, and uh, we went to certain primary schools in the province and asked and. Uh, Told kids about, about the problem we had, about the river, but the flood was coming and we had to build some protection against it. And uh, people were not, not liking it, of course, and there were different groups with different views on it. And we asked the kids to, to, to come up with, uh, with solutions. And it was amazing uh, what, uh, what, what they came up with uh, because it, it, gave, it gave us a very, very different perspective on the on problems. And that, 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 that was really important. So, so it's, it's important to, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, bring in the kids, bring, yeah. bring in youth, um, uh, and, and of course, uh, create the awareness of the problems that we're facing. Because that's also, that's also not only for students, but also for the, for the awareness. And well, I think I think you see a, a big change in that because well, younger people are more are much more um, open to to solve these problems. And it's, it's sad to say, but all the people are more likely to say, okay, 
I take my time, okay, and uh, sure. see, see what's happening. Yeah. Bernard, so we to... Well, let's, first let, let's face that uh, it was you that uh, was uh, putting the pressure on, uh, on policymakers, decision makers, uh, two or three years ago. Um, uh, my, my minister, Mrs. Zakia Katabi, uh, um, first says always, each minister should be a minister for climate. But that is not obvious. Uh, so she's asking as well you to keep the pressure. Um, because we need more work to be done also in other departments, not only by the Minister of, for Climate. Yeah. Well, that's you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. No, uh, what, 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 uh, <laughs> so um, when, we, when we talk about flood risk, uh, you should be on top about sort of what's the level of water we can expect. That's more about sort of like how often can we expect the flood. And so we, we're talking about tenants once again. Um, with climate as well as with uh, climate change or climate change adaptation. Um, and then we are talking about communities. So the people that are rebuilding right now, um, it, mostly the young people that are thinking about, do I really want to rebuild in this spot? Do they live here for the next 40, 50 years? And have my children go up here as well? Um, so it's important absolutely for awareness, right? Like I said, the flood we, that we had um, in the R Valley, we used to secure for floods, right? very low levels, uh, and then there's the sort of records, but nobody really was aware of what, uh, how extreme this event would be, and this could happen alongside such a process, right, within within schools, and basically at every level. Right? So it's it's incredibly important. And presu presumably, there's no or very little resistance in terms of discussions about climate change that you might find in an older demographic. So you're you're pushing an open door in a sense. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I, I have four kids, and you know, I mean, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit torn on this because I think you know they, I think youth are obviously this is their future, and you know they, they, um, you know they become much more aware, and also you know challenge, challenge us and the older generations. I think that is really important. But I guess what, what I sometimes, sometimes think is, is missing is, you know, to also give them the tools um, in, in terms of, you know, making their own choices. And when, when it comes, comes to flooding, it's actually sometimes, sometimes not so clear what, what actually also the younger generation, generation can, can do. And we, we have, have a really interesting example in the Flood Resilience Alliance, where Plan, Plan International, International, which is, is a big um, charity that, that works with, with, with children all around the world, they actually run these community resilience activities with a very much a child focus and sort of let, let children also play, play a key role, for example, in designing flood mechanisms, helping with evacuation um, plans and so on. And I think that's a really important point. I mean, I think, yes, children, obviously, you know, this is their future and they, you know, they need to hold us accountable. But I think we also need to think how we integrate them into basically the solutions. Okay, I think that's that's a good point. We'd be folks or ten year old next. Um, it wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, okay, I'm going to take a question online. I think I have any in the audience. Um, uh, may I ask how do the multi level governments or say the local government involve the local residents in flood issues? Are there examples of good or other good examples of this? Yeah, I, I think. Um, the, the, the process we normally have, and I, I, I'm talking about the, like, about the River Mass, then I'm, I'm, I'm involved in about uh, 17 uh, projects uh, from Maastricht until the north of the province, uh, 100 kilometers from here. Um, we always work together with uh, the national government uh, because they are uh, an important uh, uh, finance, uh, uh, finance supplier. We work, we work together with the province because the province goes. Uh, is, it, is it about uh, nature? Is it about how the how, how the, uh, the, the the environment should be uh, should be architected, so to say? And of course, it always affects the local uh, uh, the local government, like the city. Uh, and, and, and these people are also uh, 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 involved in the steering committee on a certain yes. project. Okay. And apart from that, of course, we have yeah many 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 uh, uh, meetings with. Uh, with the, the people who live, who live close to the plants we have. So 
it's very important to get to get the support from from all these uh, 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 groups. Yeah. And there's general willingness, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because, yeah. Um, um, what we do is it, it has a big impact on the environment. Yeah, yeah. and people are, are are normally quite afraid of what's happening because you're changing things. Um, uh, and and that's, that's always very, very dual because on the, on the one hand you give them security for, for against, against floodings, but on the other hand you, you, you're, 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 you're working in the gardens of the people and, 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 and that's, that has a big impact. So you have to do it very carefully, but it, it works very well. And it's, it's so real to some people. Uh, yes, question here. Uh, thank you. My name is Patrick Hankins. I'm working as a professor at the State University. Um, and I was wondering about a completely different angle to this debate because I heard many pleas uh, yesterday and today uh, for an integrated spatial planning approach to deal with flood risks. Um, but nowadays in Lindor and also in the rest of the elements, we see rioting farms. Why? Right? Because there is a huge transition ongoing in the food and agricultural system. Um, and there seems to be a bit of a um, a uh, gap between agricultural policies and, and water policies. Uh, while that this could be a major game changer, while um, uh, if farmers have to change from dairy farming to, to uh, land-based farming, going to permaculture, for example. Um, and while in Limburg, 80% of the area is uh, covered with, with agricultural land or nature land, and we talk about nature-based solutions, I feel there is a big disconnect between while we are talking about flood protection, while there is a huge chance of uh, connecting this uh, potential of farming, farmers transitioning to a more farming system based on ecological principles and nature-based solutions, which could have huge buffering capacity. Um, I'm missing this a little bit in the debate so far. So I was wondering if perhaps uh, John Dobbin could reflect on this topic. Yeah, so please. Yeah, yeah sure. uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean. Uh, basically, you have to look at it in a very integrated way, and, and farmers are a very important group to to, uh, to, to bring in. Um, this is also a, a major item in this national uh, steering committee. Uh, that uh, especially uh, the, the the money that is available for stickstoff for nitrogen is is also involved in this. So we're basically we're basically looking at it. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. Anyone else want to add? Um, if not, I'll take minutes. Uh, thank you, Medina Gabato from the United Nations University of Belgium. Um, I, I want to touch on two points, and thanks for adding those insightful perspectives from, from the policy side and practitioners' uh, insights. Point one is incentives. What we have seen uh, through literature, through sort of these transformative pathways of sustainability, that incentives play a big role in, in making this the norm. So, uh, any insights on how? people who are champions of sustainability, whether you risk land management, uh, good practices, how are they incentivized through our policy structures. The well, second point very related to that is education gaps in climate. So we, uh, we can sensitize young people through community programs or specific programs, but what about education reform to make it a long-term strategy? So we have climate champions or climate leaders for tomorrow. When we start early on, Studies have shown from Canada and Australia that in 75% of the cases, the world disaster really comes in the secondary education. So I think these are some gaps that are emerging worldwide. Thank you. Anyone want to take? Maybe I'll talk on the incentives part um, for a bit. Uh, so the yeah, already special region of the of flood. Everybody knows sort of the incentive behind uh, mitigation measures. Um, however, it is still quite, uh, like on the local level, uh, from a policy perspective, it's a hard sale, uh, always, these flood mitigation measures, because uh, they're expensive, uh, first and foremost, and um, in many cases, sort of the effects aren't felt uh, where the investment is taking place, whether that might be positive effects or negative effects, it tends to be downstream. Because in our case, we talk about rivers um, in, in, in Germany. Um, so, there needs to be a way um, before we might talk about incentives to have some sort of uh, transition, transitory negotiation process in place. 
Um, and those happen, and I think this is where we can learn a lot from our neighbors, because so we always talk about, we can learn so much from the Dutch, or the, or the Swiss, or the Belgians, because they know how to deal with the budget. But they also know how to deal with the structures behind sort of having this intercommunal exchange happen and taking place. And um, I think we have some formats uh, working through it to help start the cooperation, but to really have sort of this transit, transitory negotiation taking place, I think that might be the next step that we should take. Okay, great, thank you. Can I come in? Oh, oh, yes, sure, please. Sorry. Um, no? on, on the incentives, um, very briefly, and then on, on the education, um, on the incentives, um, don't forget that we do give uh, quite a lot of incentives right now uh, in the opposite direction. We have uh, in Belgium 12 to 14 billion uh, euro that we are giving to support the use of fossil fuels. So if we would break it down, we could use it, for example, in an other way around. We are discussing as well with uh, government structures that are supporting investments in order to take into account the risk analysis before they are providing the incentive to enterprises. On education, I'm teaching myself sustainable development at Ghent University. I have been involved in the UNU uh, decade education for sustainable development. So we are already uh, for a long time trying to get more attention uh, for sustainable development with all the elements in there. Uh, it's quite, um, uh, not, it's not easy. You know, to get into all the levels of university and you know the departments and so on and so forth. And I think I I run uh, at, at one of the conferences on education for sustainable development uh, 15 years ago. Ago, the notion of time lag dilemma. We are in a lack of time of of educating other young people, and when they come into the market in their career. 35, 40, etc. They don't have capabilities enough to act. So uh, that's quite the challenge. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Next question, Marta. Thank you so much for uh, for being here. It's great to see the three countries around almost the same table, um, and that is that is I think what we can bring in as UN University because we are here with the three institutes, one in Bonn, in Bruges, and here. Um, but I would like to have your reflections a bit on, on what would be the key challenges that we can help you with as a community of institutes, three institutes that can work together on this. And I, I hear a lot of different um, priorities possibly. Uh, one of them is the huge fragmentation that we see in expertise. Uh, we, we, we have experts on water for sure, we have experts on social economic issues, we have experts on other things. We have maybe also fragmentation in, in age. You know, we have youth, kids were mentioned. We have uh, slightly older, younger people um, like me. Um, so um, what do we do with that? And how can we bring that together? And then not to talk about the fragmentation in governance. You know, what, what is the topic of the panel? Um, we have governance in, in the Netherlands, in, in Germany, in Belgium. How could we, as this community here today, how, how can we help you in, in, in sort of aligning some of these uh, different issues, bridging the gaps, um, overcoming all that fragmentation. Okay, great. Move them to you. Yeah, um, maybe one step back. When I, in, what, what I see in my daily work is that uh, uh, I am really responsible for a, for a small stretch of river mass, only 100 kilometers. But, uh, we, often, we very often have to convince people that if you do something there, it has consequences for somebody there or somebody that upstream or downstream. It works both ends. And uh, I think and that's, that's what we, in the Netherlands, we, we look at the level mass as, as one system. And that's what we should we do more in, in the, in the, with the three countries, I think, because we are working in, in, this, in, this, in this area, in this area, which is... Which is uh, um, uh, which, which is, is quite a large area, uh, and maybe that's, that's, that could be a task uh, for for you to to bring these people even more together. Of course, we have we have connections with the Wasser uh, on the other side of the border. We have connections with uh, with uh, Wallonie, yeah. with the SPW, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with our uh, uh, friends in, in Flanders. Um, but 
it should, it should be brought together as maybe the, the three countries you want. That, that could be a good task uh, for, for you and for a challenge. Yeah. Uh, we will be help. We will be very glad to help with that, of course. To be open. Well, I think uh, that the knowledge uh, um, available at you and you and other institutes is quite uh, important for governments. Um, we launched a, a study now for setting in place this uh, OCAT climate. Uh, and when entering the room uh, here, I saw in the back there a poster on stakeholder mapping in the three countries. Uh, so that's one part of, of operation, making operational uh, this kind of structures in, in the government. So yes, if you can uh, uh, support that in all kind of uh, aspects, that would be helpful. Thank you. Great, thank you. And um, we have another question here. Yes, thank you. This is uh, Martijn Kwan from Delta House. Um, so we know of stories, for example, in France, where in the valley there was twice the amount of rainfall that we have seen in Germany. Uh, with climate change, we already see it with beautiful, beautiful summers here in, here in the Netherlands. Um, so my question is taking, say, climate change into account, where uh, also touching up on what, what would be the most extreme of the anomalies that we can expect. Uh, yeah, how do you deal with it in building resilience? Like, how do you take into account climate change when you, um, yeah, we see we're already struggling fighting, fighting climate change. How do you then build resilience um, in your flowers? Thank you. So, so the, the most extreme risks of climate change are really taken into account. Uh, properly. So, um, in in the Arbe, for example, the so the flood risk maps were um, redrawn after the flood, but they don't actually deal with the flood that we had last year, they still assume a much lower flood at a certain, certain intervals. Um, it's, it's also just because of the very extreme nature of this event um, that sort of the, the mitigation measures you would take, the investments you would do, you, you could invest up, up 400 million euros in the R Valley and the same flood would do very similar um, levels of damage just because of the magnitude. So, um, in terms of the most extreme events, the uh, proper mitigation measures aren't really, oh, sorry, the, the proper mitigation measures aren't really that realistic to think about. You will then have to think about a more holistic approach in terms of really where do you settle, and also how do you then save, if you think about the three things that you're trying to save um, around the world, with climate change, mitigation, people, uh, property, and infrastructure, then you just need to focus on the people and uh, resigned to effect that we can't say the other two. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll take my part. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And Michael yeah, Hagman from the United Nations University as well. And the title of the panel is Climate is, uh, Governance, but I want to ask a question on more comprehensive risk governance. So we're clearly living in times where we see societies are facing multiple challenges, climate change, uh, extreme events, the pandemic uh, made upcoming epidemics and the effects of the war uh, that is happening close to our borders. Uh, and this is leading to interconnected risks. Um, and they are felt across sectors as well and systems. And so my question is, I can imagine that this challenges the way how we look at risk governance. And I'm wondering if you have you know, any insights on how this is being debated, maybe at different levels of policy, um, how we can address those interconnected risks through comprehensive governance. Um, it's a point that also Svenja made earlier that we're still too often thinking in silos, that we need to overcome them. And I appreciate any insights on where you see challenges, but maybe also where you see promising ways forward. Okay, okay. thank you. Or not? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, very interesting, but again, uh, not easy to answer in, in uh, one sentence or a couple of sentences. Um, I just want to refer uh, to what I said before in terms of uh, environments. Uh, we need to be aware that we don't have trade-offs, so that we talk about uh, planetary boundaries uh, as a whole, and then climate is for sure a priority in there. Um, in terms of comprehensive governance, uh, that is for sure, um, uh, yeah, I mean, important. Can give for the example of uh, uh, of uh, working with the SDGs, for, for example, what you see right now in terms of, of using the SDGs for governance that pick and choose rather than taking them as a whole. Um, 
um, another issue I, I, we, we are coming across right now is uh, with we're referring to war in uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, what we see right now, for example, that uh, there are groups that are trying to uh, to water down the deal uh, and even fit for 55 and farm to fork and all all the other policy measures at the European level. So it's quite a job in order to uh, to go against that and then to say no, uh, we need governance and to continue the governance in, on the contrary. Well, we would, uh, and it was mentioned there before, uh, in terms of uh, the link with agriculture. Um, in fact, this has all to do with a systemic approach and uh, with a systemic risk analysis. And yes, for sure, we, we can't work in silence. Great, thank you. I'm going to take two more questions. Um, okay, I'll take three. Okay, no, I'll take three. I'll take three questions, but I'm not guaranteeing that we'll get a specific, an individual answer. So the first one is here. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, I am Jonathan Hassan, also from UGHS, and I'm also very interested in recovery. And it's often said that um, post disaster settings are a window of opportunity for change. Um, and I'll already mentioned that there is uh, uh, you now higher interest in climate mitigation. But I would also like to hear from the other panelists. Um, did something change in the club? Did you change how you operate? And if so, can you give me an example of positive change that occurred since the club? Okay, first question, second question with the group one. Yep, if you hand the microphone just over. Two or three people along. I have a follow up question to the webinar, hand over Ray, I'm an analyst. I have a follow up question to the Dead Harris Polly. So we always hear about thinking the extreme during those three days. Um, how about the R Valley? Uh, you cheated your flatness. And I think it's still not thinking the extreme. All the plugging of the bridges and then the dynamic floodway edit of bridges coming off and actually causing the SGD more set five meters on top of the actual flood wave that actually happened. So this dynamic had been removed when allocating and restating the flood maps. How is this thing in the extreme when we think about climate change having a fault? Okay, thank you. And final question at the front. Can we climate diversity of questions? Sorry. Um, I wanted to follow up on the question that Svenja asked, actually saying who owns the risk. And I was wondering who owns the responsibility for coming out stronger? So who owns the responsibility for hope and for building back different, better? And in particular, what is the role of governments, for example, make insurance sector part of such efforts and to make them co responsible for bringing change as a particular actor to this question of who, yeah, what actors to bring on the table? What's the role of governance in bringing those actors to the table? Okay, thank you. So, all we have to do is answer three questions and do a quick roundup in a minute or so each. Um, and we will try and come back to this one. Okay, so who who like? Yeah, so maybe on the question, did anything change uh, since the floods? I think definitely it did. Um, basically, uh, my, my job is, is related to the floods of 93, 95 here in Limburg. It was, it was, it was a big mess. There, were, there, were, there was no flooding defense in Limburg at all. Um, we did a lot, a lot since then, um, just enough uh, to to be on the sure side last year, because it was only a few centimeters, otherwise the dikes would have gone, uh, would have broken and, and landed with flood. So we were very lucky. We were just lucky, yeah. So no, not science, we just lucky because it was a summer, there was no wind, we were just lucky. Um, but it was a wake up call because many people, many people said, uh, well, you come with higher, 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 higher dikes, uh, why is it necessary to already 25 years ago, nothing happened in this time? Really was a big call. People have a totally different mindset. They are glad they are coming. Some, not all, but most of them are glad they were coming. Then we can do a job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. To the second question, there was obviously a flood caused by rain. Uh, and then on top of that, there were other issues. Uh, trees that were uh, ripped away by the floods, cars that were in the floods, and then obviously bridges that held the water. There's uh, there's one bridge about every 600 meters on, in the R Valley, which is uh, quite a lot. 
Um, so you can uh, create these assumptions that, of course, each of these things impacted the, the, the water level uh, one, one step further. And then if now if you can make the assumptions that we're going to actually um, build back better, or I suppose build back fewer bridges. Uh, my, the discussions are ongoing, so I can't really comment on the future outcome of that. Um, but um, following these assumptions that we are going to change how we build um, the structure, then we will uh, expect less severe impacts with the same same level of rain. Um, I'm not sure that goes to your question. That's great. Thank you very much. Bernard, final few comments. Can, uh, try. We will try. I'll try Svenja first. <laughs> okay. Hello. 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 Can you, Can hear, you me? hear me? Is it all right? No. It's still not. I'm so sorry. Okay. 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 Never, Never mind. mind. Sorry. sorry. Oh, but thank you anyway. Um, all right. On uh, the question of who is the owner of the risk or who needs to, uh, to be accountable, uh, I, it makes me think about, uh, about other policy issues. Um, we came from a, from a time where, um, I mean, society was pointing at the government. Uh, but I think we shifted from government to governance. And for me, it implies that all the actors are taking responsibility. So as well private sector, as well NGOs, as well trade unions, and so on and so forth. So that should be part of their strategy. It should for sure be part of the policy making. And um, in terms of the insurance companies, I was pointing at uh, um, what we are trying to do now, by the way, as a result of COP26, um, to look at the public enterprises that are investing, that are giving incentives uh, to enterprises in order to make them accountable as well. But we give, for example, also assurance for investments. And so there as well, we are trying to, uh, to make these companies, public enterprises often accountable uh, for the, the risks they are taking uh, with these companies. All the actors, thank you. That's a very good note to finish this session on. As with all the conversations yesterday, do you have? Can I just add something? Because we have to make a lot of comparisons. Okay, you're going to, you need the microphone. So we made uh, today, yesterday, a lot of comparisons between emergency responses between three countries, but we didn't do this on insurance systems. And in Belgium, since 2006, um, Insurance for flooding is in the general fire insurance, and that's a huge change being in Belgium. So that's really, I mean, Belgium doesn't always have the good practices, but in that term, it is really a good um, thing that was developed in Belgium, and it would be interesting to look at. Okay, that's good. So part of that could that could be picked up in the next session. Yeah. Uh, honestly, so as always with the conversations, there's so much more to dig into and to discuss. So hopefully we can do that over coffee and in the coming sessions. And then as we take this work forward. So thank you very much to our panel. Thank you very much to our panelists online, Swenya, and apologies for the technology issues as well as the pronunciations. Um, but thank you, we're gonna have coffee now and then we'll pick up again in about 25 minutes. Thank you very much.